So, starting off with Shorten Buckner tonight. I'm going to be working off of what is commonly known as the Walpurgis textbook or MS-133. And it is one of the earliest manuscripts we have, ranging from about 1300. Uh, so, Sword and Buckler is probably one of the more difficult, more intimidating things to start with. I'm not going to be working through with off weapons, just so I can make it a little bit easier, a little bit clearer. Sword length is important, especially for 133. We're assuming slightly shorter blades. Um, anything over 38, 39 inches is definitely getting to be too long for this style, this manuscript that we're using. Um, the one I have is, I believe, 36 inches overall. Buckler size doesn't matter with any reason. I wouldn't go much smaller than this one, which is about a 9 inch. Anything over 12, though, does tend to get uncomfortably heavy, hard to use, hard to wield. And really, for the purposes of this manuscript, this style of fighting, doesn't help you very much. So starting off, we're going to kind of crash through the basics um, of the system. And the first thing to talk about is the different wards. Wards are positions you enter the fight from. They're numbered. And from the text, it talks about these having to do with these are seven common positions every fencer is going to find. If you give any random person a weapon in one hand and someone who protect themselves in the other hand, these are positions they're going to go into kind of automatically. So with these weapons and styles and things in mind, it's important to know, like, obviously, this is your sword. This is what you hit people with. However, this is also what you use to stop the other person's sword from hitting you. This buckler, especially this tiny one that I have, is not a shield, right? I'm not waiting for attack to come in. I'm not going to punch a block and drive this up. I'm not going to, like, cover my head and hope I don't get a look at that. It's barely covering anything. This exists to protect your hand, right? So with longsword and other longer weapons, either I'll have a more complicated hilt to protect my hand, or the weapon is long enough that I can get the blade out in front of me, keep myself safe. For something like this, there's not a whole lot of safety with this little blade, with this little reach. So the buckler, 80, 90% of the time, exists purely to keep this hand safe. So I'm not blocking weapons, I'm covering my hand, as I attack, as I move through. So going through the wards. We're going to go through seven wards today, see how that feels. We might go a little bit deeper than that. Just real quickly in order. First ward is underarm. So with sword and buckler with 133, footwork, uh, which foot is forward, doesn't matter. All the fault, you know, kind of right foot forward for most of these, but you can do these left foot forward just as well. And there's not a whole lot of difference with this, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about stance after we go through these positions and figure out how they apply. So, first word is called underarm. Important things to take away from here is that obviously it's under your buckler arm, but your palm is away, right? I'm not holding this down at my hip like I'm about to draw a sword. This is rolled up, my palm is away, pushing out, and this gives me a couple options to attack from. Obvious option one is you should have dropped, let this roll out, and I've got a rising cut like that. However, my preferred recommended thing to do, you kind of open up this elbow, let your buckler roll forward, and you have a falling cut coming from under your arm. And it's a much more effective, much more useful starting position from here. So again, underarm, palm is away. I'm not letting this sit down here. I'm keeping this nice up and high, tucked in, rolled in, forward. Elbow stays in, always kind of out forward. They don't really show this extended out. They're just relaxed. So we got the rising cut. You just let this roll through and move through here. Or we've got that rising cut or falling cut. We kind of lift this elbow, drive the buckler forward, and press through. So notice when I'm doing these cuts, doing these motions, this buckler stays attached to this hand. <laughs> Again, that's what this is for. This is so that when I throw this cut, my hand does not get cut off and I can keep biting. So no matter how I'm doing these cuts, hands are staying together. 
Second ward is from the right shoulder, and it is shown with the sword horizontal, roughly at shoulder height. One of my pet peeves, strong recommendations here is that you do not want this up on your shoulder next to your ear. If I go to cut to my left side, my head is nicely in the way, and you will brain yourself if you're not careful. By bracing this outside your shoulder, basically on your delt, that left side cut just comes past your head because your shoulder is in the way. And it forces this motion across and helps keep your head out of the way. So this, you get hit. Of course, I've never seen someone do that. I've seen someone really close to the sharp come through and do that. And it's what makes me think this is a much better position. So again, second ward, outside that shoulder, sort of shown horizontal. Buckler is pressed forward, pressing through and cutting. So again, second, here, here. Then buckler stays out. I'm not opening. Buckler stays forward, presses through. Fun things you can start doing with this as you're comfortable is I can kind of go like this, and my sword just disappears. Even with this tiny little buckler, you don't really see when this is moving. So I can get this out much faster, much quicker here without showing a lot of movement if I use this buckler to hide that shoulder. Third ward is the opposite shoulder. Shoulder here. Again, nothing terribly exciting with this position. Again, I want to keep this outside that shoulder, horizontal position. I'm not turning this over. Keeping it here, ready to move, ready to attack. Attack high, attack low. Same thing. So notice, if I didn't have a left arm, first and third are very similar. First is up under the arm, third is outside the arm. Right, first, third. So they're very similar, very tied together. Next guard, ward, excuse me, is fourth. Fourth is from above, from high. It is kind of shown this loose above your head position again. Buckler is pressed out. It is worth noting this is shown again with the sword horizontal. Unlike with long sword, when we talked about it, long sword has this very vertical, <laughs> very high position shown. Sword and buckler keeps this flat. From here, obviously from here, big heavy cuts, things like that, able to move, able to throw a lot of mass into your action using gravity on your side. Fifth is, what well, I think it was tail. Your sword is back and away. And whether this arm is kind of bent a little bit straight here, hand position doesn't really matter. There's various options shown. There's actually a very nice uh, blotch on the page showing this guard ward for the first time. So but anything kind of back and away is your options for fifth ward. Fifth ward, notably, it is not used for this rising cut. This is the least effective thing you can do. You'll have a lot of bad power generation, lack of structure in this arm coming up. You can just feel this motion here. If something hits this coming up, that sword is going to fly out of hand, and you're going to be in for a bad day. So working from fifth, you come up for that center thrust. From here, from away, just drive up the center and control. So again, so it is back, drives up, following after. On the side, I'm away, sword comes up the center for the thrust. Sixth ward is, again, a very confusing medley. It's shown sometimes by your face, sometimes absolutely completely pro wrist rolled out, locked in, sometimes they show point behind the buckler, open up a little bit above it. Obviously, if up here, you're definitely over the buckler. But any kind of point forward elbow bent is sixth. So anything like this. And this is obviously more thrusting, changing line, controlling the center, choosing to work left or right, deciding from there. Um, the final ward, which is called the final ward, though I call seventh ward because it's easier and less ominous sounding, is what they call long point. And it is, then a little bit three-quarter profile, 
we have a cut down here. I'm going to drop relax. So I'm palm up. Long edge of my sword is down. Buckler is over. This is seven. They also show long point as low, middle, and high. We're threatening different targets. But low is seventh ward. Long point, long point. But only this is seventh ward. Maybe. So really building up these positions as more of an awareness, unlike the other systems where Longsword, the guards are important. Their positions of transition and move through. The only important ward, the ultimate ward, is seventh ward. And all your motions end here. And we'll get into detail of what I think that means much later next week, the week after. But this is an important home base position that we return to. The other positions are just places where you'll find other fencers working from. And knowing how to deal with those positions is what 133, the Walpurg effect book, starts to teach you. But everything goes back down to the seventh position, his final award. And that's kind of the core of what the manuscript talks about. So before I get too much into the weeds on all those things and what those mean, I'm going to talk a little bit of stance and a little bit of distance, and it'll probably be enough for today. So 133 is awful for stance, awful footwork, and the way to do it smart and safe is not uncomfortable at all. A lot of people you'll see doing sword and buckler have this very long sword-like stance, right? So they're square, the front knee is bent, the hips are shifted back and away, and I'm kind of sitting here neutral, ready to go, ready to fight, and I've got my buckler out, I'm ready to swing my sword. The problem though is this leg is in a lot of danger and short of fancy footwork, I can't really lock with this. I can't come down here. I don't have a weapon long enough to threaten them to keep them away from me. So I'm going to keep this leg safe by stance and position. So instead of this nice, heavy, weighted forward stance, I'm going to pull my front leg pretty much under my hips. And then I'm going to hinge back. I'm doing good morning. And we work from here. Is a much more upright position than people are used to seeing most sword fighting mean from, unless you mean like some of the Murzo stuff where it is purely I'm upright and tall and scary. We're looking for this lean, this hinge, and notice, we talked about this on Monday with the USAC stuff, I get a lot more reach without sacrificing this leg. So if we look at the pel, right, same we talked about before. If I'm in this heavy foot stance, really far forward, I can't hit the pal, but I'm sure if I lean or dove, that leg's exposed, it's going to come through and hit me. But if I can keep this leg back, even an upright stance, and I shift my hips back and lean forward, not only is my leg further away, I get a lot more reach. So again, here, I can't hit anything. This leg is really far forward. As I pull it back and lean, now I can strike and control. So learning to use that position, that setup, that bodily force of sitting here, shifting everything back to stretch forward, this is home. This is what <laughs> most of the pictures look like in the manuscript, right? I'm not straight up here and like tiptoeing over, though that's where I make people start to learn like this is really on one leg. I'm going to kind of Superman out, going to kind of settle, and notice I'm in that small angle here, large angle angle here, able to reach control, keeping my leg safe in the process. What we're, all we're looking for is a very narrow close stance. Hips go back, pushing my chest over my legs, and I can reach out and work. The unfortunate uncomfortable side effect of this is that I've got 80 to 90% of my weight on that front leg. It is definitely taxing muscularly, but it doesn't affect your ability to move, right? What I'm doing right now is I'm able to move this foot anywhere I want without having to shift my weight. So we're really looking for this hinge, this lean here, driving this out forward, really reaching, controlling the space, and just getting comfortable in this stance. 
Now I need to be here. I need to be here. Now when I'm reaching, when I'm cutting, I can turn my hips through these motions a little bit better. I can control, I can manipulate, I can move. Gives me a lot more place to work from. Even if it's slightly more taxing on this leg, on this hip. And that's just something you develop through practice, through training, through repetition. There is no easy way here of getting comfortable with this position other than just doing it repeatedly. So last things that I want to talk about before we wrap up is if you noticed when I was demonstrating the wards, I did not step with my cuts, right? Wards are wards. They're safe places. They are where you want to try to control the fight. If we have swords and I don't want you to get close to me, I'm going to find a ward that I'm comfortable with, right? And then I'm not going to drive in to where their danger is. I'm going to sit here and go, no, here's a sword. I've got something to keep my hand safe. I'm far, far less concerned with center line attacks now because I've got this moving shield that protects my sharp shield as I cut through. If I'm fighting with one-handed weapon without a buckler, I'm not going to sit here and throw cuts because this arm is a very easy, very pickable target. With a buckler out, I can throw these cuts now and not really be concerned with this arm being struck. I can sit here, keep my hand covered, throw my cuts, do whatever I want, and then move as I want to or as I need to after I see what happens with the engagement. So wards, think of them as safe places, places you want to camp out. I always make a fantasy allegory of, right, you set up your campfire, you set your wards around your campfire, everything inside that ward is safe. Everything here, I can control. If I step into this position just because I'm cutting, I'm exposing myself to danger because I'm not controlling this position until I'm already there. So think of wards as static positions. If someone's attacking you in a ward, you can just throw this cut statically, controlling, looking to control that center, get that bind. And then once you have that bind, or once you see how this is going to resolve, then you can start to step and move and control from there. So with that in mind, distances, I mean, same what we've been talking about in the past. I'm gonna start this fight two steps away from the engagement. So this is where I'm hitting. I'm gonna take one step back, another step back, and this is the distance the fight starts, right? So I'm in my ward. If my opponent takes a step closer, which I'll do for my foul because my foul doesn't move, right? If my opponent has gotten a step closer to me, we still can't hit each other, but now I'm loaded up. I've got my attack chambered, if you will, if you look at Ethan Martial Arts. From here, I can throw this cut through there. And again, if I'm being proper, turn my hinge into this, notice I backed up, right? This is where I want things to happen. I'm gonna throw this cut, use my hips, use my shoulders, get here, but I can still finish this cut and then decide how I wanna move after that happens. If I throw this cut like this, I haven't given enough input feedback from the fight to see what's going on. So for sword and buckler, if you're gonna sit in a ward, and that's not a good idea, we'll talk about that next week. When someone comes and closes the distance on you, you throw this cut, you do not step. It is not here, right? We don't get the same benefit of power generation you do with a long sword with a one-handed weapon. With a long sword, we wanna engage those hips, pull through, use our whole body, use our shoulders to move through this. We don't have the luxury. Swords in one hand, I get, I won't say maximum power from here, but the benefits of this are far, far outweighed by the disadvantages of uh, stepping closer, losing time, losing distance, losing control, because you're reacting. So wards, you camp here and you stay safe, you throw your cut, and then work from there. So first time in class, if there are questions, comments, feel free, comment below, shoot us an email. Otherwise, I will see people on Monday for more DUSAC, or we can wait for going back again on Friday. Thank you very much, guys.